Okay, now we're back, and uh, joining us is uh, Peter H. Gilmore uh, from the Church of Satan, and uh, I really appreciate you coming on tonight. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's uh, so uh, as I was saying to you earlier, I kind of uh, heard you in a interview once, and it sort of really uh, brought to attention a lot of things that I've heard about the church and uh, realized that it's not necessarily true, like what uh, what you were saying was completely different. So I had to have you on because uh, I know I have a lot of listeners, and, and I've heard a lot of the different points of view, and uh, so I thought, let's go to the source and let's talk to you and uh, find out what it's really about. Always the best approach. Yeah, you know, go go direct and find out, and then no, no beating around the bush. You know, it's uh, uh, so so so. Let's start first of all with uh, with uh, the church itself. So uh, the Church of Satan. So what is that? I know that's a really big question. I guess we brought, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we have books on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go over the book. No, let's. Yeah. I, I thought. I thought. Okay. Well, let's. How about the basic what's the fundamental of the church is it like yeah i'll I'll cover that essentially anton levey founded us in 1966 and his background was that of a showman he was in carnivals and circuses and he also did police photography and he was usually shooting crime scenes uh, kind of like ouija uh, before him and uh, he got to see really the essential nature of man which he saw as being a beast uh, just like all the rest, but sometimes more vicious and worse than the ones that walk on all fours. And so he felt that uh, humanity really had this wonderfully wide range of ability to be tragic and awful and, and criminal to being heroic and creative and magnificent. And he really didn't find any philosophy that encapsulated mankind in a realistic way. So he looked to Satan as the symbol of mankind and its potential. And so he adopted that. So he created a philosophy called called Satanism. And of course, Satan means adversary, opposer, and accuser in Hebrew. So he's standing up as the opposer and accuser to all of the spiritual religions of the world and saying, enough of that. This is not really germane to our species. We need something that's going to fit us. So his philosophy was an atheist philosophy, and Satan was employed as a symbol of pride and liberty and individualism. And he approached this as a pragmatic, skeptical, and materialist perspective, not one that has any kind of spirituality at all. In fact, he called Satanism the world's first carnal religion because it rejected spirituality entirely. So there's no faith in Satanism, and there's no uh, looking to other worlds. It's it's very much about being in the here and now, living fully. Um, he felt that uh, he needed to create a philosophy, too, that challenged the people who were in it to take responsibility for themselves. Each Satanist creates his own hierarchy of values, and that's quite a challenge for most people, because most people would rather have that handed to them from some guru of some sort, whether it be a spiritual guru or a political guru or whatever kind. You know, a lot of people are directed in many ways by forces around them, but it's the rare individual who says, I'm going to take command of my own life and, and be the captain of my destiny and, and really take responsibility for my choices and my behaviors, because when you do that, when you fail, it's on your head. And you have to deal with that. And that's something that in this culture, especially I find with younger people, they want to blame everybody else for anything that's not going right in their lives. Not that that's been not part of earlier culture, but certainly I think these days it's even more part of the way people act. They just, uh, it's everybody else's fault, not theirs. And Satanism stands against that. So it was a a way of really creating a, a, a very grounded materialist approach and uh, but being open minded too because the whole point to to understanding the world around us is using reason and science but not closing our minds to potentials of of really fascinating things because there's all kinds of evidence out there and especially uh, when you look at things that we call paranormal uh, we would call them supernormal as satanists because they're part of the re- the the uh, full existence that we have they're not outside of it but they're just perhaps more unusually experienced Hmm. So you guys, so you, so you're pretty open to paranormal aspects like uh, uh, ghosts or spirits or past lives and UFOs and all that. Well, we we think you have to investigate all of that and really be very 
critical about the evidence being presented. And uh, sadly, a lot of it doesn't hold up very well. Uh, you know, there are some interesting things with ghosts uh, that come up. And I think for me, what I've noticed that seems to be something that is consistent is that ghosts seem to play like a residue of something of some, from somebody's life. But they're not a conscious survival of life. Uh, if people were really having regular uh, interactions with ghosts and c conversing with them, then I think the world would be a very different place. Uh, you wouldn't just be hearing some weird phrase here or there, some strange sound that you're trying to interpret as a word. But you could be having conversations with Galileo or Beethoven, and uh, sadly that's not going on. So I, I don't think that that's really the way it works. Uh, that the, the ghost phenomenon may just be a, a kind of, as you might call it, a psychic residue of some sort. Uh, that's perhaps some extreme emotional situation left that. How it left it on the fabric of existence for certain perceptive people to get, we don't know yet. We don't understand all the physics. Uh, we're still trying to figure things out with you know quantum entanglement and the idea that things at great distances might be linked. And we don't even know how that works yet. It's still a great part of theoretical science. Uh, we have a lot to learn before we really understand the fabric of the universe. Yeah, there's still a lot of questions out there. A lot of questions. Oh, and there always will be. You know, we, we are fairly limited, our species, and, and we're the species on Earth that, that's asking, that we know of anyway, that's asking questions about these kind of things. And it may be, we may never know anywhere near close to all of the answers. And I think we have to accept that. But never stop asking the questions. I think that quest, the ongoing search for knowledge, is a very important part of being human and being alive. Yeah. So now, how did how did you become part of the church, or when did you join? Let's just say, how's that? Well, essentially, when I was a young fellow, I declared myself an atheist when I was eight years old. Uh, I had read uh, Christian scriptures, and I read some Hindu scriptures, and I read Greek and Roman mythology, and I saw them all as being equivalent and equally uh, fictional. So the idea that uh, a deity existed and any religion had any validity beyond what it was doing socially to me was uh, seemed obvious that uh, these things were, were social constructs. So uh, I was an avid reader of science fiction, and I went down to uh, a place called The Book Bar, which is a nice bookstore in the Port Authority bus terminal, because I used to take the bus from upstate New York, where I lived, to go down to the Museum of Natural History, where I'd go to the Hayden Planetarium and look at all the fossils. I was particularly fascinated with dinosaurs and such. <laughs> and uh, on the way home, I'd before catching the bus back upstate, because this was you know, before I could drive, naturally, uh, I was pretty young, uh, I would always go and pick up new science fiction books, you know, Arthur C. Clarke and Harlan Ellison and folks like that, because uh, that was really one of my favorite forms of literature. And I saw this book on the book rack called The Satanic Bible. And I picked it up and looked at it and thought, you know, I turned it over on the back. There's a picture of this guy with a shaved head and a goatee, you know, that was tinted in red. And I thought, well, that's pretty theatrical and wild. Like, who is this guy? And I flipped through a few pages and thought, well, it sounds kind of interesting. I've read Christian scriptures and didn't think much of them. And maybe at some point I should read this and see what this perspective was. I actually set the book back on the rack and went and got about four other books that uh, of authors that I loved. And then I was waiting on line to pay, and there was a line, you know, to get out of the, the, the store. And there was that black book again, sitting on the book rack. And I picked it up and said, all right, I'm going to read this. It's inexpensive, and it may be intriguing. And that was really it. That was the step. When I got home, I read that book from cover to cover in one sitting and realized that I was not just an atheist, that I was a Satanist. And that was really kind of a, an interesting thing to learn, that there was somebody out there who thought in many ways similar to the way I was thinking. And uh, I had a new definition for myself, and one that actually focused things in ways that I found very useful for my life. So that was my conversion, <laughs> if you will, to Satanism. We don't really feel that you can convert, actually. So Satanism is a recognition of, of yourself in the philosophy. We always say that um, the books, our literature serves as a mirror. And once you read it, if you see reflected, see yourself reflected in that, then you're a Satanist. Or uh, <laughs> you might not want to be on some level. It might alarm you. But you might find that so much of the philosophy is really what it is that you have thought all along. 
And I think that's the magic about Satanism, that it's, it's not being argued into something or, or being gi- given some kind of revelation or, you know, or you're saved or any kind of nonsense like that. It's really a very rational evaluation of yourself, being very self-aware, and then reading that literature and saying, hmm, this really is me in here. Hmm. So, so at that time, I mean, you were young, uh, but what was your family reaction well, you know, my family knew that I was pretty precocious. I was reading early and doing all kinds of things, you know, again, running down to the city by myself at a young age to go to museums and such, that uh, they, they, it didn't bother them. They weren't particularly religious. You know, they were technically, my mother was a technically a Catholic, and I think my father converted uh, from Episcopalianism to be that just so they could get married. But she wasn't any kind of a real religious person. My mother liked to play music, and she was a pretty carnal lady as it was. And my father was an entrepreneur. He was always starting different businesses, and religion had no part of that. So I didn't grow up with any kind of philosophy being imposed on me. I was allowed to observe people around me, and I got a library card as soon as I could when I was young, and really began reading just a ton of things. I would take stacks of like 12 and 15, 20 books out at a time, and read them and bring them back and get the same amount again. And uh, they knew that I was sort of unusual as a child with the way I was absorbing information. So when I finally came out and said, well, this is how I see myself, it wasn't. they weren't surprised. They were just, oh, that's part of his development. <laughs> they, they didn't give me any kind of negative feedback. They were really quite nice about it. And I've met so many people over the years, as you might imagine, and, and most folks' parents often have very different reactions. And I'm happy to say that my parents were, were really quite liberal in that sense. And uh, we're happy that uh, I could define myself and do it articulately because I would speak to them about it. And they were fine with it. Yeah. Well, you know, and I think that's quite good. I mean, in a way, parents should be more supportive. But I could see that scaring people because um, the general pop population has a point of view that... Uh, Satanism is someone that, uh, you know, it's against Christian Christians or Jesus. <laughs> well, we kind of are. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but, you know, it's sort of, I mean, more in the, more in the aggressive point of view of uh, Satan's trying to convert you and you, you hate Jesus and, you know, that sort of thing. The devil killed, you know, that kind of. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the problem with most Christians is that since Christianity has spent thousands of years trying to oppose anybody else who didn't agree with them, they figure that anybody who doesn't agree with them is going to do the same to them. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> not that they don't deserve it, uh, but, uh, you know, our philosophy is one of live and let live. And our approach is uh, as long as you, you have a point of view that's giving you a satisfactory way of handling your life, we feel more power to you. But don't try to impose it on us. And uh, we find that, of course, today that uh, many religions are trying to find ways of dealing with the government to impose their beliefs on people. We find in Middle Eastern nations, of course, uh, they're linking up with all kinds of of heavy-duty Islamic beliefs, uh, with Sharia laws and such that they want to impose on all their citizens. And uh, here we have plenty of laws that are still based on Christian concepts that really have no rational basis and uh, right now we have the great civil rights struggle for, for same-sex marriage going on. And really the opposition to it is solely based on religious ideas. And it, it obviously is something that should be swept away, any kind of opposition to that. But uh, well, knowing yeah. how entrenched these things get, it's very difficult to do. Well, the whole idea of a free country is to have an exchange of ideas and beliefs and everybody live kind of together, right? And you know, you well, know. It, it, it depends should on be. what you mean by that. <laughs> well, it's so, sort of a theory. I mean, it's in the point of, yeah. I mean, because listen, I, I'm, because uh, uh, I'm a gay man, uh-huh. personally, and, and I really don't care if someone likes it or not. Good, good. That's how it should be. Yeah. But that's how we Satanists feel, too. The whole point of freedom is that people are not free to not be offended. If what our beliefs are bother you, then that's your problem and tough. Uh, that's what a free society is all about. You do what you like, other pe- people are going to do what they like. As long as they're not forcing themselves on you in some way, then that's the consequence of living in a free society. Yeah. Well, I, sort of th- that's, I agree with that totally. I think that's kind of how it should be. 
but it's not always that way. <laughs> well, most of the world and most of human history hasn't been that way, so I, I think that's kind of a remarkable thing about the late 20th century and moving into the 21st, that we're really getting to a point where we might have an equitable social contract that could in time work globally. That, that, that will be truly part of an evolution of human society, and that's something I think that we can look forward to helping evolve. Yeah, that would be a good thing. I mean, but it's, uh, I think, definitely in our future, not, not so much right now. <laughs> we're fighting the we're 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 in the trenches and <laughs> on the barricades and you know the the revolution is going on uh, yeah. fight the, the sweep away fight. that yeah, yeah well and, and we do it and that's i think the important thing though is that at a certain point when you point out to people that it is simply a belief that is based in something that has nothing to do with anything real anything that is part of existence that's not part of an equitable rational social contract then if they can agree to say, okay, you, everybody's free to do what they want because, hey, you know, you're marrying who you want to. That doesn't mean I'm hap going to be forced to marry somebody I don't want to, which I, seems to me obvious and self-evident. But yeah. <laughs> dealing with some people is really like yeah, it's, it's uh, sometimes it's hard. Do you think that's just because of fear of, of uh, the fear of maybe not having a religion? Well, I think there's a fear in people because they are really being determined, most of their values, by something outside of themselves. They aren't self-determined. And if they see the source of those values being eroded, in their opinion, then they feel that the rug is being pulled out from under them and that they have no security anymore. And that just, of course, shows to me that they really didn't have very firm beliefs in the first place. Uh, but uh, I, that's where I think that that is definitely coming from in a social and psychological sense, that uh, the framework of their understanding for the universe around them is one that is not so sturdy and that alarms them and makes them terrified because they all want to believe. You know, religions have spent so much time telling people their lives are just a transitory time, so if your life is crap, then don't worry about it. You know, you do the right things and you're going to go to heaven and... And, you know, whatever that means, too, because if you look in the texts of Christianity and such, heaven is a pretty boring place because it's all about praising God for eternity, which sounds like serving a megalomaniac. And uh, I, I personally don't find that something I want to be looking forward to. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and it, at least the Islamic folk feel you're going to have, you know, vir virgins to have sex with or something. You know, that that's something, you know, to, that's better for them probably than what they're getting. But that other alternative really sounds pretty awful. Uh, and that's what you're supposed to be hoping to achieve, like, really. Uh, they, of course, you know, if, if you know anything about religions, there have been preachers that have tried to do things uh, where they'd say, you know, grab onto life. There was a guy named Reverend Ike who'd say, why have your pie by and by when you can have it right now with ice cream on top? And he was a Christian. And we're going, well, that's Satanism. Like, <laughs> he found our philosophy and, and was trying to turn it into, you know, throw Jesus in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Well, sell it any way they can, right? Well, the, and they do, and, and and I think you know that is a, a problem with things because since God doesn't come down and actually talk to people, aside from the people in asylums who tell you that He does, um, or running other <laughs> crazy pretentious organizations, um, that uh, again people are very insecure mostly, and that they can doubt things leads to fear. And I think that's a change that Satanism offers a, and a strength in that we doubt everything. We question everything. We're skeptics. And that doesn't give us fear. It actually provides interest and stimulus for us. So that uh, I think on a certain level that, that people who do always look towards some kind of outside authority figure to control their lives are a different kind of person than the people who look to themselves for their framework to live. I really think that it doesn't matter what culture you come from either, because you can really come from any everywhere. Uh, people come from from all over the world and become interested in Satanism because they feel alienated from this basic concept of having an authority tell you what to do and feeling comfortable with that. They've always been they've rankled under that kind of of idea, and when they see Satanism, they say, "Wait a minute, that thing tells me that that perspective says be yourself and." take responsibility for yourself and they they're not challenged they're not frightened by that and they're they're excited by that but i think that's a rare kind of person it's a sort of niche and that's why i think satanism will always be basically a niche philosophy for those sort of people yeah it's going to be hard to change people that 
um, generations after generations that live under certain religion or well, it, it is. It's very hard, especially when when you look over the past, where those religions have been linked with governmental states, and therefore were free to impose their ideas on everybody under them. You know, when you look back at the Inquisition, uh, when people were being burnt at the stake, first being tortured, uh, and then, of course, their properties and 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 uh, you know their their lands and their beholdings, whatever they had, was confiscated by the church. Uh, and of course, you know the right bribes are paid to the right governmental officials, and uh, they are profiting on anybody they didn't like, condemning them uh, with witchcraft, whether they actually were trying to practice anything that might be defined as sorcery or not. And uh, that's a scary thing when uh, when a religion has that kind of hand in glove control over the populace with the governmental force. And uh, it's all throughout human history, though, and it, it really doesn't matter what culture you look at. That's generally been the state of being for the human species. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to stop for a break now. And when we come back, let's talk about uh, the media. Okay. We're back now. And uh, conversation's been really interesting. Um, so we were talking about uh, Satanism and the church. How, how do you think the uh, public perception is? Like, I, I, I'm just as in media or Hollywood. What do you think of films? Well, there's been very little in the way of films that have actually defined Satanism in a way that's consistent with the reality of it. Uh, it's, they're usually horror films, and there's some kind of crazy devil worship going on where there's somebody going to be sacrificed to the Prince of Darkness or one of his assorted infernal minions. And uh, they're meant to just frighten people because uh, Satan, of course, has always served as an easy boogeyman. Uh, Satan is been the best friend the church has ever had as he's kept it in business all of these years and that certainly is true for Hollywood as well uh, of course though there's always interesting exceptions uh, if you saw The Devil's Advocate with Al Pacino playing Satan some of his ideas even though he's playing a real Satan and we don't believe such a thing exists his philosophy was actually kind of carnal and realistic and pragmatic and refreshingly satanic and if you even go back to um the old Roger Corman uh, Mask of the Red Death film starring Vincent Price. Uh, he plays Prince Prospero, who is essentially a devil worshipper. But there are parts of his speeches, which were really before the Church of Satan was founded, that, that movie came out, that are really spot on Satanism. It's, it's really kind of fun. And I always suggest to people that watching a good old Vincent Price movie is an excellent thing to do for Halloween. So dig out that one if, if you can. I think there's a brand new collection of them coming out on Blu-ray. And you can never have too much Vincent Price in your life. Very no, he had the perfect look and voice and everything. Oh, yeah. He was he was a handsome devil and brilliant man and an excellent actor, a total diabolical exemplar for our kind of folks to follow. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite good. Uh, is that the kind of movies you uh, watch personally a lot, or do you? what other things? Do you, do you stick to that, or...? Well, you know, I'm actually a big Godzilla fan, and uh, I really like uh, giant monster movies, and uh, horror movies, of course, are fun, vampire films and ghost films. Uh, the Haunting, the original one, is, is truly a, a brilliant movie, because it's set up in such a way that it could all be in the minds of the characters, even though they're physical manifestations, they might be as poltergeist phenomenon that are generated by the people present, and nothing actually supernatural. Uh, there may not be any ghosts there at all, and, and that's what makes that film so wonderfully terrifying, is that it explores these fringes of, of reality and what could be going on. and. Uh, uh, that's just and it's, it's filmed so well and the score is amazing it's got a lot of atonal passages and great 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 movie yeah and so so and what kind of what kind of music uh, do you like uh, t well typical th uh heavy metal <laughs> no, I, I had to throw that in come on yes of course well that's always fun because uh what happened, you know, metal decided that the devil was going to be a, a staple of that genre, and it became widespread. And, uh, of course, there are Satanists who are metal musicians. Uh, King Diamond is uh, quite open about his membership in the Church of Satan. Uh, but then there are different people, like Mark Almond of Soft Cell, and he's a member, too, as he's admitted. And I can't tell you people who aren't. We're, we're very... Uh, confidential about membership but a number of our folks have been quite open about being members marilyn manson too uh he was uh, 
definitely. I mean, he, he, he was given an honorary priesthood in our church, and uh, his he understands the philosophy quite well, even though the music that he does is his own. It's his own artwork and his own creation. It's not trying to present Satanism. It's just presenting his own artistic endeavors. Uh, but for for me, I am a classically trained musician. I have a bachelor's and master's degrees in music composition from NYU. And the kind of music I listen to, uh, really, I start with, say, Mozart and Beethoven and go up to contemporary film composers and other contemporary uh, orchestral music composers. Uh, John Corigliano is one of my favorites. Uh, he's really writing some fascinating stuff these days. But uh, favorite composers would be Mahler, Bruckner, and Shostakovich. And in the film realm, uh, Bernard Herrmann, uh, John Williams, and Jerry Goldsmith are my three favorites. So it's all exciting orchestral music, and that's really the life's blood of my listening life. Yeah, uh, Mozart was good. I, I, I That was one of my favorites. Um, anything in the pop, radio, rock category you like? I don't like any of that. <laughs> Just It's too much junk food, right? Well, it's just, it never connected for me, and, and I'm probably one of the more unusual people in that respect, because almost everybody I know, even other musicians that have the same kind of training that I do, they always have some pop music that they like, and I never listen to it. Uh, it, it I have no, no draw, it doesn't draw me, it doesn't give me the emotional resonance that, that satisfies. I'll listen to, say, a band like The Upper Crust now and again when I'm driving, because their songs are funny. Like, they basically... Um, do these rock songs but they dress up as fops and wear powdered wigs and, and all of the songs are these these hilarious social commentaries about uh, you know the, the aristocratic position but delivered in this this contemporary pop music sort of uh, genre and it, their, their stuff is funny uh, is it something I listen to for music no it's something that I listen to for entertainment uh, but, uh, yeah, no, I don't really, I'm not attracted to anything pop music-wise. Now, Anton LaVey, who founded the Church of Satan, he, too, played and enjoyed classical music, but he was really interested in what they call nowadays the American classic songbook, uh, the great songs and lyrics from, say, the 1920s through the 1940s and 50s. He really enjoyed the way that the Tin Pan Alley composers would take very poignant lyrics and combine them with melodies and harmonies that were very effective in communicating the emotional content of the words. And he could he had vast amounts of them memorized and could play them free with the keyboards and he would sort of sing, speak along, sort of Sprechstimme, you know, he was <laughs> going you know, he wasn't really a singer, but uh, he, he would you know, there's a he's done recordings of that kind of thing. And he'd do a very sort of a like a band kind of thing that you'd find in a, a dive bar where they are, the cigarettes being smoked and the half empty scotch glasses there and maybe there's some lipstick on the edge of it and you know the lights are low and people are sort of trying to feel each other out for wherever the night is going to go and that, that kind of atmosphere is something he liked to capture and uh, he would do that when you'd visit him. He would, had a huge bank of synthesizers he had programmed to imitate these different sorts of cheesy bands. And he would play all the different keyboards. And he even, since he was an organist, he could also play foot pedals. So he would recreate this. And, and he'd love if you'd sing along with him different things. So <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So, so now, um, I was going to say that, uh, so in all, Hollywood's not really... A positive thing for this Church of Satan, or just well, Hollywood, most Hollywood films are, are really just meant to frighten people when they bring Satanism up. We'd really love to see something where a Satanist was an actual character and was the skeptical, intelligent person who maybe solved a, a situation. Uh, you know, who kept cl you know clear-headed and was as somebody that you went to maybe not the hero because that might be way too much for the general audience to accept although who knows maybe that'll happen before i pass Super away Super satan yeah yeah well you know there, there's certainly when you watch uh, these contemporary superhero films loki is uh you know the devil in the norse mythology and, and he certainly is getting lots of love from the audience and uh, you'd have to say that in the Avengers, Tony Stark, he is a total Satanist in philosophy and the way he behaves. So, uh, yeah, I think we, we've got some, you know, they're not explicitly Satanists, but we've got some very Satanic people out there in films that are quite popular right now. <laughs> and, and so how do, you, how do you like the way the media portrays it? Because for me, every time I've heard 
in the past. You know, it's always some sort of, you know, um, some sort of serial killer or some sort of something that's pretty pretty bad. And they're always sort of saying, well, it was a devil worshiper or a Satanist and, you know. Well, that. you know, yeah, that's that's been a, a, an issue for us. Uh, back during the 80s and 90s, there was something called the Satanic Panic. And at that time, what was happening were Christian evangelists decided that a way of, of getting people under their control was to tell the world that uh, they had been former members of evil cults that literally were in communication with the devil himself, and that they were, of course, they were all high priests and high priestesses, uh, and these would be people with an IQ of about 76 sometimes talking, so you'd think, well, Satan's got pretty low standards where that's concerned. Uh, but... Uh, you know, the, the idea was that from kids spraying graffitied pentagrams under, you know, highway overpasses up to generals of leading armies and corporate heads, everybody was tied together in this grand conspiracy ruled by Satan himself from the underworld to uh, subvert Christianity in the word of Jesus. And uh, newscasters, uh, particularly Geraldo Rivera, uh, ran with that. They found it a great way of entertaining people and getting attention and they promoted the, these people saying this nonsensical garbage and I spent a lot of time on shows with these folks uh, debunking them and the FBI naturally spent time researching this because all of it was alleged criminal behavior and they don't take that lying down. Mm -hmm. So when they looked into it, they really found no evidence of any of it. Uh, what was sad, though, is that we found that that kind of journalism actually got people to imitate the sort of villainous portrayal that they were making. And we would call these people Geraldo Satanists, where a bunch of kids would take drugs, they'd put a pentagram on a tree and then they'd go out and decide to uh, sacrifice a cat or something because they thought hey I'm being a, a Satanist and, and this is cool and I'm evil and I'm rebellious and frankly that was not a good thing where do you think they get the idea to do something like that just uh, you know I, uh, just to, to actually go and sacrifice a cat or, or a goat or something right yeah, well, you know, it was every day on, if you're watching these talk shows, people were telling you, oh, this is going on. There are Satanists out there with portable crematoria and that women are breeding babies for Satan that are being sacrificed. We had that McMartin trial, which was, I still think it's, it's now the, the most expensive trial in all of American jurisprudence. And that was all about child abuse and sacrifice at a daycare center. And none of it was true. It went on for years. It ruined people's lives. It cost millions of dollars. And it was all nonsense. And this kind of hysteria is something that seems to grip the public easily. And when you have folks who are basically a, have a P.T. Barnum attitude of whatever the show is and can make us a few nickels, let's run with it. When so-called journalism is uh, putting on that kind of dog and pony show, and then Hollywood, of course, follows suit too. You know, as we said before, that you know the horror movies. Are there. There's always been horror movies. If you go back to the Black Cat from the 1930s, uh, you have Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff, and Boris Karloff is the brilliant architect of an ultra modern building, and he's the high priest of a satanic cult. But of course, when you see, you know, he's he's brilliant. He's a genius. And the people following him are all dressed in tuxedos and women in beautiful evening gowns and. Their uh, whole ritual chamber is futuristic with strange angles and pylons and very art deco. You know, even then they were trying to deal with Satanism as something scary and frightening because Karloff was murdering the women that he was in love with and preserving them in glass cases because he didn't want to lose their beauty. <laughs> so they, they made him essentially a form of serial killer uh, to frighten people. But uh, when you look at it, though, even at that point of view, like, the Satanists are people of wealth, wealth, power, and intelligence. Uh, and clearly folks who were not, they weren't peasants, let's put it that way. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, that, that myth has been there for a long time. Yeah. And, you know, and journalism's well gone all, excuse the pun, gone to hell, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really has. Journalism's now just, for the most part, entertainment. Oh, it's utterly entertainment. But the worst part of contemporary journalism is nobody does any research. You could issue a press release that said a giant spaceship landed in Cameroon and, you know, elephant-like aliens came out and waved, you know, and then invited Jesus down for tea. And people would say, they just report it. They, they just repeat it. They wouldn't in any way 
examine that there was some factuality to this. And there are plenty of folks who take advantage of that naturally. Uh, it's why wouldn't they? It's it's an easy way to get attention, and if you can get attention, you can probably get money off of people. Mm. So that's what's going on in the world. But uh, when I was growing up, uh, you know, I used to read newspapers that actually had fact checking, and that if something was an error, they'd print retractions. They would uh, be really concerned about getting things straight, and uh, you know, they when they had opinions about things, those were in editorials. The rest of the reporting was trying to explain factually what had gone on. Oh, With the yeah. blog culture that we have today, everything's an editorial, and nobody understands that that uh, that's really not journalism. That's that's something different. When you're when you're doing something like that, you're intruding yourself onto the stories that you're working on. And I really think that the, since those lines have been blurred, and it's all become infotainment, that uh, yeah, journalism is certainly dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's. I mean, I I can't rely on. Uh, any of the network news broadcasts any more than Facebook? No, no. <laughs> well, you know what I mean, because you see things on Facebook about things happening. This Martian landed or, yeah, you know, somebody died or something, and it's just the same as watching a network. It's, you know, it's whoever's the prettiest. and <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, well, it, again, our, our, our culture is set up to worship celebrities and stars, and you have these vapid, pretty people who have nothing of importance to say, and everybody's following them around, wondering what they're doing. And I have to look at that and ask why. Like, most of them are not doing anything of value, at least when you had some some actors were doing excellent portrayals. Uh, you know, you might say that, that that's interesting, but do you care what they think about anything else? I don't think so. I'd be interested in seeing them act a good role in a movie, but I really don't care what they think about anything else. Yeah, if I just wanted another person. It yeah, and, and, see, and that idea seems to really have been lost on most folks because they they worship celebrity. And with things like Facebook, which are brilliant because what it did is it gave everybody celebrity. You're a celebrity with your friends, you know, amongst that audience. You can be the star. So uh, Andy Warhol's idea of 15 minutes of fame has been long extended by things like that. Yeah, I love all the pictures of, here, I'm having breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Here I'm going to the bathroom. Great, <laughs> <laughs> lovely. <laughs> well, you know what's funny too about that is my wife makes a point about it that uh, you might put up something that uh, you know. Oh, I found this. I went to this place and had this amazing homemade chocolate ice cream, but it's in an ice cream parlor, and it was stunning. And somebody else will then chime in. I don't like chocolate. I like strawberry. And you'll be like, who asked you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and see and that's one of our satanic sins is don't give opinions or advice unless you are asked. In fact, that's the number one sin. Uh, uh, actually, excuse me, the number one rule of the earth that we have. Um, you know, what we in Satanism, of course, we've set up this idea that uh, we have uh, rules of the earth which are about how people should live with each other, and we have sins that are essentially behaviors that we don't want to do. They're nothing that anybody's going to punish you for, but they're things that you might feel kind of like an idiot if you, you get stuck doing these things. So that, uh, you know, for us, of course, stupidity is the cardinal sin because we think it ought to be painful. <laughs> you know, we, we try to, the whole point with Satanism is to try to get people to behave in a rational manner, to whatever your capacity for that might be. And that's certainly a tall order. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I can't I can't say enough about that. Okay, well let's take a, a break here, and we'll come back and talk about this more. Okay, we're back now, and uh, with us still is uh, Peter Gilmore from the Church of Satan, and uh, we left off talking about well all sorts of things here, but <laughs> <laughs> it's been really really interesting. Now. I know people would probably be interested in knowing kind of what your life is like as a Satanist, and I don't like labeling people or labeling kind of what everybody does, and this is, you know, they do this because they're that. But I guess in a way, if you could talk about that, like what, what, how much do you go to the church? Like what is the church involved? Do you go every day or every month, and uh, what do you do? Well, most interestingly, the Church of Satan is, is a concept, it's an idea, it's the people in it, it's not a building, we don't gather for meetings or services, 
Uh, essentially, it's the Church of Satan are people who share the philosophy of Satanism. And since the basic idea to our philosophy is individualism, everybody determines their own personal values and tastes and pursues them. Uh, Satanists might deal with each other uh, if, if they can meet each other by knowing that they're Satanists, but they really only interact on a deeper level if they share other things beyond Satanism. Because Satanism is, again, just a, a tool for getting the most out of your life rather than a devotion. There, there's no worship in Satanism. There's no faith in Satanism. We do have ritual, uh, but ritual is is basically a form of, of psychology that we employ. Uh, lesser magic is something that, that is a form of magic, which is manipulation of people around you. It's learning how to be charming, uh, learning how to be glamorous, speaking to people so that they will do things that you would like them to do. Uh, it's, it's, it's old school charm. Uh, which so many people seem to have lost these days because they simply think that because they exist, everything should be theirs, uh, which uh, I think older folks like us uh, find a little tedious. Uh, but <laughs> our, our greater magic, is, is um, which is ritual magic, is the idea of having uh, an emotional decompression chamber. Uh, it's, a, it's an intellectual decompression chamber, as Anton Lavey called it specifically. The idea was to set up a framework of ritual where you express emotions and release them that are hindering you from pursuing your regular pursuits. And by getting that out of your system, it's a, it's a form of self-therapy. It's very cathartic. Uh, you could call it self-transformational psychodrama if you want to use fancy words. Uh, but essentially, it's, it's a way of, of really making yourself feel better uh, you can deal with gr grief or lust or anger, all of these things, any kind of emotion that you have, but, but one that's, that's become obsessive in your life, and the idea is to, to let it go. And then you can go out and do things that you want. And uh, ritual is a dramatic format, and it's very personal because you're dealing with these, these deep emotions. It's not a worship service. It's not, hey, you get a whole bunch of people together and they pray and jump up and down and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, LeVay gave a uh, basic format for ritual in the Satanic Bible and the Satanic rituals. And uh, that can be altered at will because, again, ritual is meant to be something that's personally affecting. So it's not something that we need to have other people for. Ritual can be solely something you do yourself. Uh, and it can all be done in your mind, too, in your imagination. It doesn't need ritual tools like candles and bells and all that kind of stuff, uh, which is fun. It's theatrical, and I think a lot of people enjoy being the center of attention in ritual. That's that's a, a clever aspect of our satanic ritual. Uh, you can always be the celebrant in your own ritual. So you, you run the show and uh, you don't have an audience in ritual. When you go to a lot of worship services for spiritual religions, there's some kind of priest of some sort and he's interceding with the supernatural entity that the folks believe in. And the congregation is generally just repeating things and standing up and sitting down and praying and doing all that kind of stuff. But in, in many instances, it's not uh, something that they are really participating in in a way that's significant emotionally. Uh, some of them are. I mean, it all depends on what you get out of, of that kind of rite. I know uh, I had just uh, attended a, an old-school Catholic funeral uh, just a few days ago, and it was done in a, in a church in uh, Jersey, and it was definitely the old kind of church with the spooky statues and the stained glass, and it had a nice organ and all of that. And uh, the, the priest was actually a, a good fellow in that he was kind of in putting satanic ideas into the way you would think about someone who's deceased. Because often the Christians are always, oh, they're better off, they're with God, it's so much better. But he kept emphasizing the idea of remembering the person who had passed away. And that's something that's essential to us. In the satanic funeral, which I uh, wrote in my book, The Satanic Scriptures, the whole point of that is remembering what the deceased did for you in your life, how you interacted with them, how they enriched you. And the, the whole process of the, the funeral rite is for people to come forward and talk about that if they feel free to share that kind of thing. If, if it's too much of an intimacy, they can ho keep it to themselves. Uh, but uh, we think that there is no afterlife in Satanism. We really don't believe in such things. And that you only live on in the memories of others uh, or by anything that you left that you created during your life. Okay, so so the, so you don't really follow an afterlife. Like when you die, it's over. Yep, that's it. Which is why life is so damn precious to us. Uh, don't waste a minute because you're not getting that minute back. You can't tell when you're going to go, 
And for us, we try to live life as it's uh, going to be a, like a lovely party that you don't want to leave. So really, don't waste your time. Like, don't defer things that you want to do. Uh, most religions tell people that the good stuff is happening after after death. As what Monty Python said, you know, do you get afterlife mints? Um, <laughs> You know, and we don't think that you're going to get in any afterlife mints. Uh, you know, go out and buy some, you know, nice truffles right now and enjoy them. <laughs> Just one more mint. Uh, <laughs> so, so then, uh, no afterlife, no thing. So, no reincarnation, nothing like that. No, no, we don't think that that's. The, we think there's no evidence of that, and that uh, it's just. It's just people living pipe dreams. I think all those ideas were invented by folks who wanted to control people who basically